All right, so let's get started. Um, this is being recorded. So for anyone who wants to rewatch or share with a friend, um, this recording should be available by tomorrow evening via the Ice Cream Social site. Um, so let's welcome all of our audience members. Thank you for joining for our third virtual event. Um, in conjunction with the Terrarium exhibition, which is the first show at Ice Cream Social. Um, I'm Jen Cacciola, I'm the program director here. Let me give you guys a little peek at the space for anyone who hasn't been here before. So the show populates the entire floor. Um, there are artist studios that are being built out in the space right now, but for this first show, the pieces kind of had the entire spread. So we had a lot of extra um, space for full installation work and pieces to spread out across the floor. Um, and so this show was created through an open call that we put out generally relating to themes of growth. Um, and so the artists who we're talking to today all have works in the show and we kind of threaded them together through the theme of tonight's talk, which is ideas of comfort and privacy um, and how those themes relate to community and an individual's place within a community um, and what role everyone's practice plays in that kind of support within a community. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction of each of our artists who are speaking today. Amanda L. Andre, is an award-winning Filipino-Romanian American playwright residing in Los Angeles by way of Washington, D.C. and Virginia. Her plays and visual art seeks to center, um, seeks to center the concealed wounded places of history and societies from the perspectives uh, of diasporic uh, Filipino women. She takes inspiration from her parents' stories of their homelands, wanderings, and exile to explore and celebrate liminality, hybridity, ancestral healing, and rendering of the invisible visible. She holds an MFA in dramatic writing from the University of Southern California and an MA in communication, culture, and technology from Georgetown University. Stephen Baboon is a queer Haitian Syrian artist from Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and based in New York City. He received a bachelor's degree in film and media arts, as well as a minor in education studies from American University, and graduated from Parsons School of Design with a master's of fine arts in photography. Baboon is a multimedia artist creating through photography, video, performance, and installation. His work confronts social and political topics in Haiti, from polarizing and controversial issues to elevating the importance of Haitian culture, family history, and immigration. The phenomena he explores in his work range from the Haitian queer experience, multiculturalism, and Haitian identity, toxic social structures such as classicism, discrimination, and political corruption, the lack of acceptance of religions other than Catholicism, such as voodoo and Islam, to the Haitian gaze, Haitian history and culture, Haitian pride, Haitian beauty, and more. Natalie Haregui Artiz is a Mexican-American artist from Hayward, California, based in Brooklyn, New York. She holds a BA from the University of California in Santa Cruz. She's exhibited work at Southern Exposure, the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, the Cessna Underground Altar Work Studios and Glass Gallery at Manic Contemporary. Residencies include the New York Academy of Art in New York City and at Arts, Letters and Numbers in Afro Park. She is interested in painting and exploring themes of isolation and belonging, often collaging images and memories that echo. Her work employs an intimate vocabulary and a documentation of otherness. Jumana Mograbi is a Syrian-Bulgarian photographer living and working in New York. Within her practice, she documents moments experienced between our public and private world. In 2021, she received her BFA in photography from Parsons School of Design in New York City. Through a diaristic approach rooted in still documentary and photography, 
She explores themes of the home and rituals of domestication while focusing on aspects of memory, identity, and the self. So again, thank you for all these artists joining us today um, and being willing to look into their work through this very specific lens and share it with us. So let me start off um, by letting the artists give you a little intro um, about the specific works of theirs that are in the exhibition. And then after that, we're gonna take a wider look at their practice through the lens of the theme tonight. So I'm gonna pass it to Amanda to give us a little info on these four pieces that she has in the show. So it's these two and then this pair as well. I'll flip between while you're talking. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, thank you everyone for, for being here. Um, it's so wonderful to be with my fellow panelists. Um, it's so wonderful to be in this show. So thank you, Jen, for, for organizing it. Um, so these pieces, I guess, are in a way part of my playwriting process as well. Um, I started uh, kind of doodling while I was at uh, another residency. And these are, these are, I call them shadow people. And my other friends who have seen them also like to call them ghosties or anitos, um, which is sort of like a Filipino term for uh, spirits. And I really like them because they sort of go to places where I don't necessarily go on stage or that might be too expensive to go on stage and their bodies move in ways um, that I don't know. I don't think I could ask an actor to do it. <laughs> um, but and just just the flying and sort of like the airiness um, that they have, the, the somersaults and everything. And the fact also that they're not... Um, speaking that they're they're quite silent so they sort of offer me a reprieve from a lot of the work uh, that I do in the theater and I find them sort of like charming and haunting which I would say are two characteristics of of my plays so there is there is that connection there as well yeah I think this combo shows that maybe <laughs> pretty clearly <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah thank you Amanda yeah Okay, and I just included some um, install shots. So this one is, um, I've mentioned before that this space is like pretty difficult to photograph clearly because it's such a weird orientation visually. Um, all the work is installed on the cage walls or somewhere on the floor near or inside or outside the cage. So Amanda's are, I think everyone can see my mouse. So there are these little guys hanging along the walls, again, like playfully. <laughs> um, and I think I have, yeah, so this detail shot. So they also have this whole conversation with this little um, cavernous shape that's happening between Sarah Valeri's pieces and the pedestal with Lindsay Davis. So that's her work up in the space. Um, and so Amanda's, oh, Amanda's are kind of toward the front of the show, the part of the show that's inside the large cage space. And then if you're walking a little further into the cage, we have Natalie's work here, um, Stephen and Jamana, just so that everyone can kind of locate themselves. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass it to Natalie now to give us some information about the two paintings. And just so you guys can see the scale, she has one large one and then this tiny guy underneath. So this is the large piece and the tiny one that accompanies it. Take it away, Natalie. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, thanks everyone for coming and for uh, being a part of this. I'm really excited. Uh, so this painting came um, 2021, but really the idea started in 2020 and it sort of encapsulates this feeling that I've experienced throughout my adulthood of um, not quite fitting into certain communities or certain spaces. I grew up in a very diverse community, uh, very uh, Hispanic, Latinx, strongly community. And as soon as I graduated high school and just sort of uh, was released into the world, I found myself in these situations that were uh, difficult and new to navigate, just being surrounded by different um, people who live different lives. And it came with a lot of interesting, 
uh, feelings of sort of weirdness and not feeling like um, I fit in quite a lot because although I might look a certain way, I don't exactly fit into that sort of category. Um, so I painted this painting actually in 2020, but I did not like that painting. So I repainted it in 2021 um, and that now we have this painting. Um, and the window sort of represents uh, the left side being sort of like the past of a photo from um, sort of an assembly line. The middle kind of represents the a little bit of a past but more of a present, a backyard in Pennsylvania. And then the far right window represents um, a march in New York City. And um, yeah, this painting sort of just came about from a, a long period of feeling a certain way and experiencing this sort of otherness in um, my own new communities. And is this so, well, I'll let you decide if this one kind of is a partner <clears throat> to that, the same themes, or if there's anything extra that you might want to mention about the smaller one that's right under it. Yeah, they're sort of like cousins, maybe second cousins. Uh, I painted this piece actually around the same time. So a lot of my figurative work feels very heavy and can often take a long time because I've put so much into it that um, I have to create smaller paintings uh, on the side or in between breaks to sort of just get a different quick easy painting out that feels that gives a sort of different feeling this one I painted while right after I had my wisdom tooth removed um, but they were created around the same time yeah. um, and I should mention you can for audience members if you want to add a question into the chat I can see it. So it might look like it flips off into nothingness. It comes to me. <laughs> um, so I'm monitoring the chat at the end of the talk. If we hopefully have some extra time, um, we can pull out some of those questions. So feel free to light up the chat. Um, and then I wanted to include this backwards look. So right next to Natalie's piece um, are a few pieces that kind of, I feel like, frame it with even more like anxiety <laughs> so it's there's this like lightly tensioned moment but then right next to it we have this kind of like bumpy um organic like strange shape by Lindsay Davis this little sculpture here and then this super intense like prying open drying um by Anya Rosen so just to give people a sense of like the emotional motion of the show leading up to Natalie's pieces. And then you walk down a little ways um, and Steven's piece is backed by another photography piece of his and Jumana's are neighboring it. Um, but I also wanted to show this view because something that's cool about the space is this layering of work. So Patricia's piece, um, if you were at our last virtual talk, um, you would have heard her speaking about themes of like ancestry um, and heirlooms that happen. So it's nice that, to have that piece as a backdrop for these pieces in the show that are a lot about social growth and connectedness. And this is a view down that hallway. So this is the other work by Stephen. Okay, Stephen, take it away. Yeah, um, Jen, thanks so much. It's amazing to be in conversation with my fellow pa panelists. It just shows that even though we have different stories, you know, we have a piece of this larger mosaic. And I feel like we don't create an avoid. I mean, it's crazy. Like I'm hearing Natalie speak, Amanda speak. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, yes, I, I'm taking little pieces of <laughs> their narrative. I'm like, this is exactly how I'm feeling too. Just like um, for this piece, just like Natalie mentioned, um, I grew up as a, as a queer Haitian Syrian in Haiti, right? I grew up in this kind of multicultural society realm. And as a child, you know, you don't know where you fit in. So um, my practice really stems from childhood memory of feeling sexually alienated and culturally alienated. So I never felt Haitian enough. I never felt Syrian enough. And I never, felt, I never felt enough of both because there's this queer factor to my identity. 
that's uh, juxtaposed in s such conservative environments. So this piece is called the Haitian Queer Renaissance, and it's it's talking at the most elementary level. It's talking about the Haitian queer experience, and hate in Haiti right now. You know, there's so so much queer phobia in legislature, in government, in history, in pop culture. There's no queer gay representation anywhere on the island, um, and so really this plays on. Kind of me in this in this provocative kind of haphazard costume, and it kind of feels like almost renaissancey to kind of give it that uh, to bring that you know timeless to the contemporary. Just because even though there is gay art and gay painting in Haiti, you know that's erased from the consciousness. So that those feeling of alienation really catapult, catapults my practice. Yeah, and it also is a nod to the fact that, you know, this is not a new population of people. <laughs> they, you know, yeah, Jen, people that's... have existed in all of these forms that we're maybe hopefully better at defining yeah. and naming, but it's always been this full spectrum. Yeah, you know? and, and to that point, queerness was, was an indigenous identity. It's, you know, the introduction of colonization, globalization, maybe the introduction of the Catholicism in Haiti kind of started to repress um, these. So that's a good point that you shared. I'm sorry, one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other one is called Grandchildren in Transit. In 2019, I went back to my grandma and grandpa's village in Syria called Melki. It's a very small kind of poor village my grandparents immigrated from Syria to Haiti in the 50s to flee economic and political oppression. And so I've always wondered out of everywhere, you know, from the Middle East to the Caribbean, that's such a interesting and to me, so far, you know, so far fetched like pattern of immigration. Um, so I was interested in, in that. Um, and so this is an image, a portrait of my cousin and so I'm ex um, who grew up in Haiti and left at eight months old. So he left and went back to Syria. So I'm tracing these little pockets of immigration, these little pockets of Haitian Syrian hybrid identities. You know, he lives in Syria and he listens to Haitian music, cooks Haitian food. So there's a little pocket of his hybrid multiculturalism, even in Syria, right? So this is definitely an exploration of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and this is another viewpoint to see the kind of stacking that happens. And there's this nice little framing moment <laughs> that happens with Tavia's crocheted piece um, that just like adds this layer of chaos on top of it. Okay, I'm gonna pass to Jamana now. So um, if I go back to... So Jumana's pieces are stacked up right here, um, but they're basically in this order as a triptych. Okay, I'm gonna put you guys on that side. Jumana, take it away. Thank you. Hi guys, um, thank you so much for joining. Um, so this work is a part of a larger body of work that I created in the past year titled um, Dreaming About Splitting a Snake in Half. It was my thesis for my final year at Parsons, and it was kind of encompassing um, the idea of violence and witnessing violence in the everyday um, as a result of um, past violent events that I have experienced. So it really kind of focused on um, violence as an entity and almost like a cycle that just kept being reborn over and over again. Um, it also kind of focused on the idea of maybe inheriting cer like certain types of violences from parent to child and kind of those interconnections within your family. Um, so these three works were always kind of intended to be a triptych. Um, they were kind of the first photos I ever took for um, the project. And it's crazy that they kind of made it towards the end as well, because so much got cut out. Um, but my mom is a huge um, inspiration for my work, but especially for this work, it's almost dedicated to her. So the first image of her um, back is very important to me in the relation of violence and kind of this like infliction of these bra lines that um, she kind of like inflicted upon herself by wearing it. Um, at the same time, 
light was also a very large uh, part of this project and the idea of light being kind of harmful or almost um, acting as a witness to something and shining a light towards like a certain issue. So um, the light and the bag kind of like correspond to one another um, in that sense and kind of thinking again about light in like a weirdly violent way, even though it's portrayed through a very soft gaze. Um, and then the final one, uh, which is the infliction one, um, is kind of a larger understanding of the theme of hands, um, because they're very prevalent in this work, both um, um, in this archival images that I use uh, of my father's hands that are just kind of cropped in. I think you'll be able to see some of them later on. Um, but it was kind of thinking about hands as both um, healers and protectors of violence, but also inflictors. And with this photo, it's kind of like, not really sure if the person is healing or doing kind of the damage on the leg. Um, so to me, kind of like um, represented this uh, idea of violence as being kind of a witness to it um, and thinking about these past memories of, of violence that I um, experienced or I saw and then seeing how they kind of um, are re reborn um, in the everyday that I experience and kind of it was, yeah, that's it. Um, so I want us to get started. You guys um, sort of alluded uh, to different at level, different levels of um, specificity, but themes of um, multiculturalism and your different racial backgrounds for all of you, again, to different degrees seems um, like an important source. Um, so I'd like to talk about your sources in general, but also specifically about the racial experiences that you've had that play into your work and how you're using that maybe to communicate to people, right? So maybe we can start with Stephen, since I know it's very it's a very specific thread in your work and it's very intentional um, and it's, put toward a service. So we'll start talking more about community later on, but um, as far as like your identity and how you're thinking about it in your work, as well as other sources that might make sense to mention for you. Yeah, um, of course. So this, this image um, was taken back home in Haiti in 2018. And I'm, at my, I'm actually at my grandmother's house um, and you can see kind of the family photos off to the side. Um, I'm posing in this, and actually, I'm po I, I used to live in my grandma's basement <laughs> until I was 14. So this is the small little living room area that she, I guess, um, renovated. Um, <laughs> but um, I see multiculturalism and queerness as almost like the same. This has the same essence. Multiculturalism, you know, there's it's so anti-resolution. You know, you, you you're sort of thrown in into a mix of these different influences, these different cultures, and you're supposed to make sense of it. And society tells you, pick one, girl, like check a box, like I'm not trying right. to, but that it's not supposed to make sense. It not, makes sense for certain people, and for other people, it's not. Sure. It's nonsensical. <laughs> and also multiculturalism is also the future of humanity, you know, with globalization and immigration and people, you know, marrying different cultures and, you know, um, you know, we have a huge population of mixed um, people and all of that, you know, multiculturalism, it, like, it's starting to be, it's starting to, it needs to be kind of uh, talked about more and kind of like, um, be anti-resolution, there's no wrong or right way to exist. And so for me, it plays, multiculturalism plays a big part in my work because, you know, being influenced by Haitian and Syrian culture, I'm sort of creating, I'm sort of in this lab, I always see myself in this lab kind of creating a hybrid identity for myself, kind of creating a, a, an identity that doesn't exist, that society has pushed me away from both of my identities. So I have to be, meet in the middle and build my own my own self and existence. So that theme of building and anti-resolution and being fluid in your cultural and sexual identity is uh, important. And I go back to my grandma's spaces like my grandma's house or spaces in my like elementary school or soccer fields, places where my, multi my identity has been compromised or rejected. 
So yeah. as the starting point. As the and you kind point. of like pick yeah. from that bush yeah. and make your own pie out of it. <laughs> I'm making my own country. Like when I'm in Haiti, they tell me to go back to my country. When I'm in Syria, they tell me to go back to my country. When I'm in the US, they tell me to go back to my country. Like, geez, like, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my own little, my own little metaphorical, abstract, artistic country, I guess. So that frustration also um, yeah. contributes to my practice as well, as silly as it sounds. Sweet, Amanda, um, I know this is a topic you speak on a lot and you use in your teaching. So there is like a supportive aspect that you try to provide through your work. Um, and we did mention at the top of the talk, but I'll remind everyone that primarily Amanda's a playwright. <laughs> she just happens to make these awesome drawings <laughs> as well. <laughs> so you have all of these plays like under your belt that are dealing pretty specifically with all these issues, like the individual, um, the individual's identity in communion with a larger place and people. Um, walk us through yeah. how you how you are handling all of that. <laughs> um, yeah, well I I just I just love everything that that Steven said and I I I think something that I just love um, is we're making our own countries and like we're making our own space and spaces like because we've had to bridge uh, so much <laughs> we're and we're just like it's it's exhausting to sort of um visit if if we even can afford to visit and there's always this pull of like oh my gosh like if I stay here that means I'm not staying there and it's um and so I think also for me um we make our own time so this play um this is set in the future. And so I have been like looking at a lot of like alternative futures and alternative spaces and times. And sometimes that feels like the best container to talk about um, multiculturalism, like, like being speculative, right? Um, and, and being fluid, like, like Stephen was talking about. So yeah, so this, um, and one of the reasons I put this picture in is well, number one, it's been hard to get production photos because graduating in May 2020 in live performance was, <laughs> as you can imagine, something else. So, the, so theater is still kind of like feeling its way out as far as yeah. like being virtual, as far as being hybrid. Um, and this piece is, uh, it's, it's hopefully we're going to see it in New York in like the next few years, actually. Um, but these are young women and um, two of them here are uh, identify as Hapa, as, as Asian um, and something else, I guess in this case, white. Um, and they're also Latina and they're also black. And so, I don't know, I, 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 I love to see multicultural bodies on the stage, multicultural characters, multicultural roles. Like there's something really about um, seeing those, those people and then kind of questioning um, ourselves about what we might think they are. Because I think that's a question that some of us as like multiracial people get a lot, like, what are you? And so then it's sort of like, well, what prompts that question? Um, what's, what's in you making you ask that? Um, and so I think my plays, uh, especially, I'm looking to not answer those questions in one play, but over like the entire body of work. Yeah. Okay. Um, Giovanna, same, same question for you, um, but I, I get the sense of loss also. So I'm, I want you to speak on, on your experiences and your sources. And then because I get a lot of, of senses of loss in your work, we'll maybe transition and, and speak a little bit more on that as it relates to some other artists' work on the panel. But take it away. I'm gonna move you guys over here so you can see. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, 
having um, lived in so many different places and also um, immigrating to the U.S. at such an early and like developmental stage um, has influenced me a lot to kind of think about where I fully fit in. Um, I'm always really frightened of like forgetting and I think that is one of the biggest sources of why I photograph is this fear that I'm going to forget um, my home country, I'm going to forget my family that is still there, um, I'm going to forget memories mostly um, that I have had. And so also like forgetting kind of creates this sense of loss. Um, and I think a lot of my work also deals with loss and nostalgia and my brain kind of correlates nostalgia and loss in like going into hand in hand. Um, but especially in my work with how I photograph people per se, I don't really um, tend to photograph uh, portraits or kind of head on. It's always photographing the things that they leave behind or the remnants that they are leaving. Um, to me, that's more um, personal and it feels more uh, like an actual state, not statement, but like an actual um, indicator of who that person is. Um, and especially with this series, um, there was a lot of loss and a lot of, a lot of birds, um, a lot of dead birds, <laughs> specifically birds that I just like witnessed, um, like came across. Um, so with this one, the bird had, um, that wasn't the only instance, uh, they've been like kind of all over the place that whole winter. And I remember looking it up and it was actually a positive sign of a rebirth and like new beginnings. So it was always interesting that this tragic death that occurred for something right in front of me um, was indicating something positive. Um, but the idea of loss to me is kind of, in not only in this work, but again, in every other work I create because the person is not there. It's, you know, it's like the bed sheets that they were sleeping in or the pillow that, you know, they were laying in, it's always an indicator of, of that they were there at one point, but they no longer are. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and to give such a, I mean, the, the car one, I just, I love the wound shape. There's something very bodily about the cropping um, of this and the shape of it. And it's like a tearing out when normally you think of a car crash, you think of like impact inward but there's this strange like curtain unfolding and bodily thing happening. Um, but the chicken head too is like so specific. Yeah, There's something so identifiable about that face. And normally like, you know, you think of roadkill and like maimed animals and all that stuff. You, it, it becomes even more of like an, object um seeing it in those contexts so it's just incredible to see such an identifiable face that makes the loss multiplied you know you're emphasizing that sense of loss with the specificity um and natalie i'm going to go backward to your terrarium piece for this question nope it's not letting me go because I feel like that one is the clearest like instance um, to, or the clearest context um, to talk about like your relationship with race and the, maybe the art world even, like that's something we could talk about specifically because that's a whole other thing <laughs> I'm sure. But yeah, like how you're using that as a source, which you kind of um, spoke about a little bit, but. Yeah. Um... Definitely source from experience. And um, I'm actually working on a newer series that I'll probably talk more into later where I paint other people and not myself, but it all kind of comes down to painting from my own experience of this otherness that I experience as um, someone who I, a lot of people think or approach and they wonder if I'm mixed race when I'm technically speaking, fully Mexican American. Um, but because of how I look, you know, there's a lot of questions and it brings a lot of different experiences of, you know, I, I comes with a lot of privilege, but also um, a lot of what's the word when you don't fit in <laughs> and just getting sort of shunned out. Alienation, sort yeah, of. Exactly. Um, and just, yeah, I've been sourcing a lot of 
my paintings, whether they look like this or their portraits of other people or even uh, the still lives, they always come from this lens of um, this othered experience, not quite um, fitting into a box of this is who you are. This is exactly what you look like, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm interested when we get to the, the newer portraits to see how that translates when you're kind of in communion with a sitter, you know. Okay, and then I think I had an a image, yeah. So Amanda, um, maybe you can talk about kind of the same question, like ideas of loss um, in regard to this piece that you had. So this is a promo image for one of your plays. Yeah, this is- um, um, I Wish I Were Silver. I love that title too. <laughs> thank you. It's from a, it's from a Lorca poem. Um, and this is, I guess, in many, well, like all my plays are about my mother, <laughs> but I was gonna say maybe this is sort of more directly to my mother. Um, and my mother was a journalist. That's sort of how she met my dad. She's a Filipino journalist in Romania. And she, um, so she passed away when I was 16 and she left behind basically like her archives, um, which is like an amazing treasure, right? Like to have your, your parents' letters, to have their photographs. And my mom collected her family's photographs in the Philippines and everything but they are a pain to carry around. I remember, Jen, when we were talking about storage, <laughs> like I didn't realize yes. that artists don't want to because as a writer now in the digital age, it's just all on my computer for the most part. Lucky. But my mom, <laughs> right? I know. And my mom, she was a writer in a more analog age. So I like had to think about getting rid of papers, which is like really tragic, but it's like, how do you keep on like living and so I, I right Sorry. you know but the the hard copies, but there's something like, lost in the material yeah. you know like especially when you open a letter and you realize that you are maybe the third person to ever see this letter you know yeah. and to read this very intimate correspondence so so that's something I think that's just a stage where I'm at in my artistic practice like both as a playwright and then now kind of trying my hand with more materials, just the, 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 the volume of it, and then how to make art out of what's already there, like out of what my, my mother left behind in a really tangible way. So this is a play about that, <laughs> but maybe one day some more texture, yeah. So did you keep any of them? Did they all get digitized? <laughs> no, we, we still have them. I suspect okay. I'm going to have them for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, totally. I think that's um, what makes most material decisions for artists is like, what needs to leave the studio right now and become something else? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I also, so like sort of on the, as we lean toward talking about ancestry and history, um, I got ceremonial tones from especially Stephen um, and Amanda's work. So Juman and Natalie, feel free to also jump in. Um, but so I pulled these up because they're like the most specific <laughs> of your images, Stephen, that I, that I got that kind of sense from. Um, and I know you're dealing with sort of like the cross section of different religions and dominance between them um, and practices among communities. Can you tell us maybe about these projects or the theme of how ceremony works in? Yeah, Jen, I think you're super spot on with the word ceremony. Um, my practice and my images are kind of ritualistic, kind of kind of creating an altar for my subjects. So um, I, uh, in my artistic research, I photograph um, folks in, in the Haitian and Syrian community as a way to dignify and immortalize their important roles. So um, on the right, it's Fet Ezili, which is, um, Ezili is in Haitian voodoo, she's the goddess that so she's the goddess that oversees, that protects children and protects marginalized queer folks. 
So I resonate a lot with Ezuni Frida, which is an amazing, amazing spirit and uh, uh, goddess. And so these fabrics that you see come up in my uh, photographs are, they correspond to different, so each uh, spirit and god or goddesses in the Haitian voodoo uh, religion, each color corresponds to a different spirit. So blue could be Azuli, purple could be Samzibaon, which is the, uh, the spirit that protects the graveyard, uh, that watches over the dead, watches over family. So really it's bringing in that important aspect of my culture into this world making, set making idea yeah. of graphic practice. And so for me, you know, you know, when you hear the word Haiti, I don't know, I don't know when you Google it, you know, it's, it's always, you see kids in, in, in poverty or you see, you know, these uh, National Geographic uh, photographers taking photos of unfortunate uh, situation, coming back to the West and exploiting these people. So in media, we don't see ourselves, our Haitian existence being dignified or being um, kind of elevated in this, in this, in the status that all humans are supposed to be represented justly and kindly. Yes, I can have certain privileges. Yes, you can have less privileges, but it doesn't mean a photograph should be uh, reflective of that. We're all humans, kind of all this community. And so, yeah, rituals and also this idea of ceremony, this dance between subjects, set, and photographer is very important to me as well. This idea of dignity too comes, comes up a lot in my life. Yeah. I, I love, I didn't realize that about the, the colored fabrics in your yeah. work, which is a, a, a theme throughout a lot of your projects too, are these like very ceremonious, um, like the shrouding acts. And there's something like, even though this is a singular figure, the fact that the colors are calling on all of these different other figures yeah. makes it communal. Yeah. which is exactly. an important part of ceremony is that like it's a shared experience and objective sort of and also this idea of community like when i take an image of somebody it's not my image anymore you know it's yours it's our it's this dance this ceremony this like you know community and that's how i see it Um, and Amanda, this is another screenshot from, from also from Black Sky that I thought was like <laughs> perfect for this theme where these figures are really like, I don't know, there's, there's something happening around them that like is raising them in this moment in a ceremonial way. <laughs> Tell me yeah. if I'm way off. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, um, spoiler alert, but it's okay because the play is not going to go up for like <laughs> another year. So. No, no, that's not true. No, um, uh, so this is, in this moment, um, these, these young women are witnessing a solar storm. So they're basically like witnessing Aurora Borealis um, in Virginia, which is not normal. <laughs> It should not be happening fear. there. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's, it is interesting because I think this is sort of like an earlier play of mine. And I think my earlier plays tended to be, they're speculative, but like sort of more scientific. And I think over the years, I've sort of like moved towards more of like the spirituality and the mystical yet at the same time in this play, they are still, um, this is sort of like their mystical, like uncontrollable moment where they are, I mean, they, they sort of have a choice, I guess, like to to surrender or like, what are they going to do with um, the natural world kind of like exhibiting a supernatural um, force, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's this question of like, believe or not believe in their faces, sort of. Yes, Join yeah, or exactly. Mm -hmm. Sweet, and then some more images from Stephen that are more talking about ancestral connections, I felt, which is another, like, I feel mainline in your work that you sort of touched on, but I just, 
And maybe this is the same reason um, that you mentioned about the colored fabrics, but there's this wonderful like choreography that you do with fabrics where you're either hiding, shrouding, or the fabric like becomes its path or you're creating tunnels like the piece that's in terrarium. And all of those things like illustrate how we relate to ancestors, right? It's either like, you know, nothing about this side of your family forevermore, or you, you are feeling through the events in your life, like this direct threat that I feel kind of in this left piece. Can you talk to that? Like how maybe your ancestors are present in your work or what you're seeking ancestrally? <laughs> if that's a yeah, definitely. Um, so first of all, like this use of fabric is autobio autobiographical as well. It comes from my, uh, my culture's voodoo religion, but it also stems from my grandma. She used to sew curtains and pillow covers and she was, you can, I mean, in the interior design standards, she was horrible at color match. <laughs> she would do like neon green, royal blue like I'm just like and she used to be so happy and I used to watch her sew when I was a kid um up until I was 14 I would never ask her to teach me how to sew I just would love to see just love to see how childlike she creates these kind of creations but one thing that these fabrics have in common they are both uh the visual identity of my country Haiti and Syria. So these are the only common thread so far that I can use. Like the fabric is this metaphorical country where Haitian identity and Syrian identity can coexist. So I'm using this as a kind of as a thread to connect both worlds, both cultures, both homelands, and kind of as an homage to like either my ancestors, you know, from their path to immigration or my ancestors in the spiritual sense. They're always in the pieces through the fabric or through the people. Also this idea of covering the face um, is, is important to me. I'm, I'm, not too, I'm not too interested in showing eyes in the face and all of that. All Specific the identities. Yeah, because just to keep that ambiguity, uh, kind of my subjects kind of become these monuments of multiculturalism or the journey of immigration or all of that, so, and or ancestry. So yeah, kind of these shrines, you know. Yeah, and it it um, allows the viewer to step into the subject's body. You could imagine your it's more it's easier to imagine yourself as that body without exactly. a face, yeah. you know. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Amanda, I consider these your ancestors. These little guys, <laughs> so <laughs> they're kind of your. Well, you explain it better, but they're like your um, artistic ancestors. You're, yeah, you're, like my muses. Uh, yeah. 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 So. Like guides. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, they're just so sweet, right? But also weird. And I think it's good to kind of keep that weird sweetness or that sweet weirdness, you know, and to like look for it like wherever we're going. So like th for these, these are um, pages from like a National Geographic, but you know, um, I think, I don't know. I think it, it, it plays a bit into my practice too. Um, like I like to take a lot of walks and stuff and to, to sort of like clear my mind and like keep my body moving um, in between like the writing and everything like that. And there are, there are some practices where, you know, when you go outside, you sort of like look for the omens around you, you know? Um, and I think of that with these little people. Are <laughs> they kind of whatever like, they are. Don't go this yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, just or like just blocking like- blocking off streets for you. Don't go this way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, go, go the other way, you know, right. Or like, or maybe they're very small or maybe they're very big, you know, and it's, it's sort of like, but, but to me, they're always helpful. Yeah. You know? um, and there's some, um, like, in, yeah. in your statement about these, there was, um, you explained it in terms of like, that 
they that there's always there there's kind of stand-ins for those presences that always precede the idea and i just love that idea of like as good as your idea is it's not original in the end like mm-hmm. <laughs> it has I know, right? <laughs> from somewhere else if you yeah. don't you know as hard as it is to admit that we are all just kind of like kicking from the tree and like just changing a little something we pick off a petal yeah. and it's a new flower you know like yeah so i love that idea of admitting the histories of your inspirations and ideas mm-hmm. kind of by yeah. giving them and like being bodies. playful <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah exactly it's it's interesting too looking at these i'm so glad to have seen um to, to kind of like hear Stephen talk about his the photos and the maskedness because like I'm sort of yeah. like dealing with that concept right now in in one of my plays like what oh. does it mean to have like a helmet or like a full to, to obscure the face and these ones they don't they don't really have obscured faces no. but they don't really have faces <laughs> yeah so it's interesting it's to just... think of like yeah the the face what what having the suggestion of a face right right like what that does yeah yeah there's so little but you but can mighty. tell they're <laughs> smiling <laughs> yeah right <laughs> think of a smile in there <laughs> cool um just a reminder if anyone has a question you can um add it into the chat the chat will only come to me anything that's entered there so at the end of the talk um if we have any questions i'll go through and pose those to the group Um, So now I kind of want to pivot um, wrapped up in this discussion of the individual of um, isolate or like alienation and finding your idea of your identity. Comfort has to come into that discussion um, because you're going through your own process and maybe you're along the path further than someone else who's walking the same path as you. So there's this like cycle of comfort that needs to happen. Um, And so Jamana, I wanna throw it to you um, with these two images or just speaking in general about the ideas of comfort in your work. I think there's a lot of like either overt or hidden gestures where it's playing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I, speaking speaking about comfort, I feel like I'm a very private person when it comes to talking about myself and like talking about the things that happen to me. Um, like even my friends have to kind of like pull things out of me. Um, and so with photography in general and art making in general, I think the comfort in being able to control kind of the narrative that you want to talk about or the narrative that you want to create is probably the biggest comfort I get from making art. Um, It's also allowed me a lot to kind of, again, think about past memories and events that have happened and not necessarily, you know, change what happened, but definitely see them in a different light because of the way that I'm creating the work that is about it. Um, So to me, I kind of see comfort through art making and through kind of resolving whether it's past issues or, or again, past events that have happened. I think art is one way where I'm kind of able to, again, resolve them and be able to create these narratives that kind of allow me to um, think about them more broadly. Um, And I think with the way I photograph, it's, I try to do it through like an empathetic lens, which I don't, I don't even know what it means, but whenever I try to take photographs, I always try to have a sense of empathy and Um, this idea of providing comfort even for other people. Um, I know that my work is very personal. It's, it is diaristic, uh, but at the same time, I think I try to leave as much room as possible for other people to see themselves in it and find themselves in it. And I think that's, at the end of the day, is just as important as um, me being like, this is a story about me and what happened to me, so. Um, so Natalie, some of these pieces that you were mentioning start that were starting during the pandemic or that you were working on during the pandemic, um, I kind of feel there's at least undertones of comfort, either seeking comfort or providing comfort. Um, but 
for all of you in this discussion of comfort, maybe you're not seeking to provide it, maybe you're seeking to receive it, kind of like what Jamana was mentioning, or are you seeking to disrupt comfort for an alternate goal? You know, so it could be any direction. Um, Natalie, where do you see comfort kind of fitting into or your larger practice doesn't have to just be like this body of pieces? Yeah. Um, so in my newer body of work, like this one and the next one, um, I definitely don't think about comfort so much. It's not in the forefront. Um, but in what I'm doing, which is, you know, painting otherness, there is an implication of this uncomfort feeling, you know. Um, but I, I think, especially with the, I see at the table, the painting, the larger painting in the show, yeah. my work used to um, focus more on the, I guess, negative sides of this uncomfortableness of being in between spaces, you know, not fitting into a certain box. And I've decided, you know, through different critiques or hearing different feedback that I wanted to shift the narrative and stop focusing so much on the uncomfortableness and the negative aspects of, of discomfort mm -hmm. and focus more on um, the positives of being in this in-between space, you know? So this painting, uh, Lola too, it's the second time I've painted my friend Lola, um, is part of my painting friends series. And I, I paint them and I interview them, but Lola is next to be interviewed. We just haven't set that date yet. Um, of just painting other or people who experience otherness and really hearing um, what they have to say about their experiences. And the answers are very, very beautiful. Everyone has something new to say. Um, and it's been a very, uh, really satisfying process of um, painting in a more positive light and focusing on, um, I guess, not focusing so much on the negativity of this discomfort yeah as an other individual you know you're kind of viewing it as like uncharted land right that can like offer new discovery yeah. right like the comfortable path is boring we already know what that's about like what's in this in this like margin of discomfort <laughs> yeah sort of like also i want to bring to light um the experiences of people who experience otherness of discomfortness or discomforting yeah. environments you know I want to uh, back to what Humana said about light being um, exposing you know uh, painting this painting made me realize how much I love painting light and how I'm sort of exposing <laughs> yeah. sort of exposing this different experience yeah the you get the sense of like how blinding that light is in this one. And this like supercharged blue outlining that happens kind of makes me feel that underlying sense of panic or anxiety. Um, but at the same time, like when you sit with that blue, it's gorgeous, right? It's luminous. So it's uncomfortable at first, but it's kind of functioning the way that you're describing those themes as functioning in your work. And then there's this wonderfully radiant, like what, 24 karat gold purse <laughs> down here, right? It looks like this magical object that's just like bathing itself in the light. <laughs> Sweet. Um, Amanda, can you speak to, I just, yeah, this, <laughs> maybe I was totally off with interpreting comfort in this scene, <laughs> but no. let me know. Like, <laughs> Well, I mean, because you're also a, dealing with like audience comfort too with your medium, you yes. know, within a space that you're creating. Oof. I mean, and that is such a good question about like, as a playwright, mm -hmm. to what extent do you want to comfort the artist? Yeah, I see Stephen nodding. <laughs> as, yeah, <laughs> in performance, right? Because it's like, there is an element, I certainly of like wanting to provoke, um, wanting to 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 have them well I don't know I think certainly maybe for the kind of work that I've been making lately I do hope that it's something where like 
upon leaving the theater, it's like, oh, what can we do? Um, An urgency. Which, right. Yes, exactly. Which maybe is like putting me in the realm of like Brecht right now, who would do theater that was like very non Aristotelian, right? Um, very like inter audience interactive um, and stuff like that. So um, I don't know, that's, that's sort of like for one of the images later, but I was working recently on a play about the filming of Apocalypse Now, which happened in the Philippines, not in Vietnam. Um, I don't know if folks know that movie. It was filmed by Francis Ford Coppola in, like, the 19, in 1976, um, and it was about the Vietnam War. And um, so there's like a lot of techniques that I have in my play that do things like offer the audience food, but then like take it away or like give them drink or like rattle, like turn the lights on and off in the theater, you know, things like that. Um, and then so I'll also person. add, <laughs> I know, <laughs> right. And it's also interesting because it's like, how do you workshop that over Zoom? And like, how do we, and then even in sort of like the traditional or like the development processes that are in place in the theater right now, how do we um, help that come along? Cause it's, it's a play that's like not, it's not easy on the page and it's not easy in a workshop. And I hope maybe in some ways that it wouldn't be that easy in production. So, yeah. So I guess in a way that is disrupting our notions yeah. of, of comfort and like what's a comfortable process for making theater also yeah. maybe we've or, gotten too comfortable. and you're kind of like I imagine as a viewer you're expanding the spectrum of comfort by having those like extremes back to back of like mm -hmm. feeding <laughs> like flickering yeah. lights like all of this you feel yourself like at those two poles of comfort yeah and that happens a lot in this play too, certainly in this image. It's a very frenetic moment where they're trying to comfort someone in a very, in basically an emergency situation. And like, I don't know, I, I kind of all been dealing with that question for the past two years. How do you provide so. emergency comfort? <laughs> yeah, Urgent exactly. Comfort. Yeah. Um, Steven, same question for you. Um, but I also want to start um, talking about your goal of like elevating the narrative, which you sort of touched on in the beginning, but I feel like, um, you know, comfort and that goal of yours are kind of linked in your work. Yeah. I love that question of comfort because it's something that I, recently started thinking about comfort not represent not necessarily represented in the images but in the process of creating the images mm -hmm. um i value you know the process before taking an image um which i share with a lot of photographers that amazing photographers that came up before me but for me the process of collaborating with my subject creating the sets scouting the location, um, you know, choosing which fabric uh, is important this day for that space, choosing how I want, choosing how the model or my subject or my, or my yeah, wants to be portrayed. So I think the process leading up to the final image that you see here is comforting. Yeah. It's sort of this, for, a, for, for like an hour or two when I'm shooting, nothing else matters but my subject, the space and what we want to create. So I think the comfort comes from the process. But when I look at my images, I'm, I'm not comforted because they, 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 deal with, they deal with a lot of discomfort that I had to face or my subjects had to face to come up you know, with, with an image. But I think the process is comforting. Um, if that makes sense. The, the process of, of, of creating this image and knowing yeah. that both subject and photographers has this, has this harmonious dance that they're doing. Like we have to trust each other. And that's, yeah. that feeling is comforting. Not necessarily, I don't know if it's the photo, but I don't want to tell what the audience should feel. If you feel comforted, I did my job. That's cool too. <laughs> yeah. And so that process of creating comfort is the foundation of that is asking questions, like is attaining yes. the no obtaining the knowledge of the cared for, exactly. right? Like you can't provide that care unless you ask those questions. Exactly. 
you know, and also the second part of what you were saying is that like to communicate these uncomfortable things, um, maybe the communicators don't have to be made uncomfortable in that process. That's like a nice idea. That's a nice proposition you're making is like, yes, these narratives have to be told, but can we do it in a way that doesn't like constantly put that discomfort or pain on yeah. the people who have who have to tell it, right? Exactly. And also it's not always, I, I mean, I, I'm talking like I make photographs that only deal with trauma and all that it's not i mean it's yeah. also the creation of beauty within trauma yeah. or hey some images some days i just want to create beautiful images and there's merit to that you know there's merit yeah. to creating something beautiful without really weighing it down with any sort of emotion so but i love what you said jen i'm gonna take notes and add that to my statement <laughs> i love that that was good do it. It's all true. I'll, I'll credit you. <laughs> I, like that. I want um, <laughs> royalties, please, <laughs> on your book. <laughs> Sweet. Um, Natalie, is, is, so I get a very, like, personal way of working, even when you're working with your sitters or your friends or your resources, it's all, it seems very, like, very personal, right? Is is the community and like is there is there a direct like tangible goal that's like suited toward toward a community, or is it more about like what happens in the studio and whatever that contributes to the viewer or larger community? Do you have to like keep that out of your mind in order to work in the studio? Because that's also true and valid for many people. Does that question make sense? Or is it just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is do you have like a larger community goal that you're trying to provide through the work? Um, a little bit. I really, at least with this body of work, um, with the portraits, maybe not the still life. Um, I really want to just paint um, friends and uh, colleagues who have experienced otherness. And um, often, I don't know how it, I decide, I'm still figuring that out, but I'll just decide, okay, this person needs to be painted, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, my other friend who I haven't painted hasn't experienced otherness. It just sort of... Um, it's more of a feeling of, you know, this is my decision. I want to paint this person right now. Um, and yeah, as my community of artists and friends grows every day, um, who I want to paint or who I decide to paint changes and gets bigger. And I'm really excited for that. Um, but it's definitely, it's an experience. Um, in the I usually take photos of them. So when I paint, it's me in the photograph. Um, I, I've done painting from my cell phone. I'm not going to do that again. I've done painting from printouts. Um, now I'm doing painting from computer, um, but I'm thinking it might go back to printouts and computer. It's a process, but it's painting wise, it's usually me and some sort of image. Image, yeah. I, um, I find video works really well because you get a sense of like, of the motion, right, and the mannerisms. Um, I, I don't work um, with specific figuration much anymore, but like what I was making swans the other day and like <laughs> watching videos to get a sense of like how this thing moves outside of my imagination, how I think it moves sometimes works. Is it life. like a boomerang style where it sort of shifts and perspective <laughs> a little I bit? Guess you could I guess you could make a boomerang that might be better to work off of than like a full length video. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, Amanda, I'm gonna throw it back to you to talk about this project. You mentioned a little bit like the difficulties of <laughs> Zoom things, mm -hmm. but it, I guess it gives you a wider reach too in your ultimate like goals for community? It does. Um, I mean, I'll say one thing uh, about 
Zoom, theater Zoom is that it, it actually is really good for development, especially like initial reads um, and, and sort of like short workshops. And yeah, giving people a chance to like experience very new, very fresh work. Um, and this was a pleasure to write. This is uh, a pleasure to write. It's funny. Um, so it's an adaptation of Hecuba by Euripides, but it is set in um, like Filipino town, Los Angeles, and it has to deal with reproductive justice, um, specifically like a woman, a Filipino woman named Hecuba who was forcibly sterilized and sort of like the fallout from that. And it's dealing with like a lot of alternative consciousness and, and universes. Um, and I would say like, as it relates to community, it is, I mean, I think that's one of the things I just really love about writing plays is that it it's an occasion to bring the community together. And one of my mentors uh, would say that being a playwright is like being a monk and a party host and kind of going between those two <laughs> roles of like solitude and yeah. contemplation and your writing and then like putting on an experience for the community. Yeah. And, and I you know, and for me, I just, I love being able to create roles that actors can take on, um, especially, you know, roles that they might not necessarily get to play in our mainstream media, and they can take it on, try it on, and that, like, other people can do that. So, like, someone in LA can do that, someone in New York can do that, someone in, like, Texas can do that. I find that just so um, incredible. And like, even if the play, you know, goes away, there's still like the friendships and the relationships that are made um, through the meeting uh, of that play. And that's, I think, something that's been really important to me. Like the first play I ever wrote um, that was performed over 10 years ago, it sort of the two two of the actors who met in it like launched a cabaret series that is like still ongoing. Oh, that's so cute. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like gives people the chance to meet and then grow. Yeah. Yeah. So in in the creation, there's also community. Yeah, that's something mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. often jealous of with mediums like this that are like require multiple hands, right? Like you could do mm visual art that projects that require extra hands but it's that, not as like so... integral as something like yeah theater. I mean I was gonna gush about ice cream social <laughs> though because like having a space is so important it's so yeah <laughs> don't hold that yeah but like that space is so crucial because I feel like space mm. is such a premium like renting space or like having to find it, having to store props, having to like, where are you going to have your rehearsals? Like Zoom alleviated a little bit of that, but like not all of it. So that's like such wonderful potential for, for, you know, the space. That's not just an exhibition space. It's more. You know. not. I will put that mm -hmm. out there. We are very multidisciplinary. <laughs> Open for crazy stuff. <laughs> um, Jumana, tell me about your work in relation to this, it, like if, if same question I posed to Natalie, basically, is it more important to you to try and keep like these larger goals out of your head while you're in the studio working or is it just core and something that's always happening during your practice? I think it's something that's kind of always happening, even if it's subconscious, um, mm. not like fully realizing it. Um, again, especially with this work, because it is so personal and so um, connected to a very specific event that happened um, to me, um, I know that it is kind of like a self kind of reflection of myself. But at the same time, I think being able to create this work and kind of uh, portray just again the idea of violence as something maybe not so um like flashy in the sense that it's not always going to be depicted as that like obviously the image mm -hmm. of the bruise is a direct depiction of violence and um, inflictions of it and remnants definitely of it but the image of the window is kind of 
more along the lines of stitches and bodies and kind of seeing that violence again in everyday situations and um, kind of being reminded of it. So I think it's always a subconscious thing with me, but I know it's um, especially being uh, lucky enough to work on this um, in school and the support of my friends and the support of the people I was in school with, I was able to kind of form a community that understood the value of portraying um, mm. tricky subjects in maybe not the most obvious way. Um, and so I think to me, that's how it kind of has always played out that it's always kind of in the back of my mind, um, mm -hmm. even self-directed and self-published, however it is, yeah. And by making work like this, you're also slowly, artist by artist, building a community for more work that is experimental like this. Definitely. So it's like, just by making the work, you're building community. Yeah, absolutely. I think the last year at, at school definitely showed that um, and was very mm -hmm. different with how we were supposed to, you know, um, go on about our thesis, but also the ways that we supported each other throughout mm -hmm. it was very, um, very, very helpful with the works that everybody was making because everything was really deeply personal, so. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit um, and kind of lump together some of the questions we had. But if if you guys think this is an important question um, for your practice, is like how much of this, who are you making the work for basically? Um, is it is the viewer meant to be part of this community that you're speaking about? Um, yeah, like how, how does the viewer factor into what you're doing and how you do it, if at all? Um, I think with this work, uh, I think towards the end, the viewer was very, um, was considered a lot more. Um, I think, again, creating such a personal body of work, I kind of realized that people were gonna see it and um, people were gonna read about it. Um, and listen to me explain it. So I think, again, it, even if the work is very personal, the viewer is always gonna be there because somehow the work is gonna, you know, be broadcasted or shown. Um, but to me, I think um, there's such a, a lot of the artists that I look at, like Rinka Kawachi and um, Anna Mendieta and Lucille Boyeron, they kind of are very, um, their work is very intricate in the way that they show these personal projects, but there's such a universal feeling that they create um, that everybody can relate to, um, especially Rinko's work. Um, any, literally any photo book you look through that she has created, you will feel exactly what she wants you to feel. And I think um, this like universal feeling of like empathy and comfort and understanding, I think is what I'm trying to aim for. Um, mm -hmm kind of encompasses the viewer in the best way I can. And like I've said previously, I try to the best of my abilities to leave room for the person to really exist in that work as well, because I I want them to as much as they want to as well. So. Yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna, well, maybe just briefly, um, same question for you guys. So first for Natalie, are you thinking of the viewer, are they factoring into your work while you're making it? Oh yeah, um, I guess not so much. Uh, I make paintings that express um, sort of my own experiences, even if it's through the lens of someone else's experience and really the paintings for anyone who will listen. Um, Cause I think we've all experienced otherness to an extent, but it's really for anyone who will listen. Even same uh, question. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I, I make work for my community in mind, in my heart first. But I see kind of art in general or my practice as kind of a dinner table. If I'm inviting you to my house and you've never eaten Haitian food or Syrian food, you're still in my house. You're still we're still sharing a meal. We're still sharing a drink. We're still in each other's company. Although you won't understand the fullness of my life and my domestic life and my private life and this and that, but we can share a moment together living in that cultural space. So honestly, who am I to tell 
you know, I mean, I feel like welcome, you know, you can peep through a hole, you can sit down at the dinner table, or you can be fully turned off and be like, I'm out of this. I'm, I'm out of here. I don't understand anything. So cultural cues and cultural illusions shouldn't be a barrier. I think it should be actually right. something more curious, like a curiosity aspect. Yeah. Amanda, you're muted. Um, I was just thinking about what a great dinner table metaphor and uh, yeah. <laughs> party host. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's interesting because I think um, I would say that I like, I, I write for myself, but also like in hopes in, yeah, in hopes that other people will also find it transformative. Right. Um, and I think also that it's, uh, in some ways, like maybe if it's um, not necessarily getting the reception I perceive that it should be getting at this moment, you know, my hopes are in and intentions are that it will in the future for like our artistic descendants, our like future ancestors, you know, who, who are coming about. So um, yeah, that sort of like skirts around the question a little bit, but um, <laughs> so do these shadow people so <laughs> <laughs> okay i wanted to kind of just um just use these next few slides to point out something that i see happening um and if you have an urgent point feel free to jump in and cut me off but um with everybody's work i'm seeing a lot of like scale shifts happening between interior and private and then the wide expanse and open um so like figures or objects that are enclosed versus being exposed in larger spaces um that kind of a, a formally speaks to this idea of an individual and a community um even like jamana in the cropping of of this hand versus how much space you're allowing in images like this with the bird uh, with the birds. Um, and Natalie, especially in these quarantine paintings, like a very tightened, enclosed space. You're even doing that with lighting. Um, but then there's multiple glasses. So you have like this enclosed space, but it's alluding to other presences coming in and out of the space, perhaps. Um, and even the title, like when you think New York, you think like public, packed, populated. <laughs> so like instead of maybe some random suburb, quiet suburb of America, you chose New York, which to me speaks to like communal spaces, communal living sort of. Um, yeah, and these wonderful examples, you were speaking about this series um, earlier. These are the newer works that you're mentioning, right? All the portraits, so like showing, um, I included these as a contrast because like in this one, we see a path. So like, it feels very intentional, this conversation that we sat to talk with her when there is this path to keep on going on our own. And then in this one, um, it's, it's kind of enclosed, right? There's this wall of trees behind, but she's very soothing. She's a soothing presence. Like we're, we feel okay staying in this private space with her. Um, did you, I don't wanna drive by these since I know they're really important in your new direction. Do you wanna mention anything about these? Oh, well, that was just very beautiful. <laughs> How you um, uh, did I interpreted it, it. Aligns with what you're thinking. It does now. <laughs> the one on the right was painted in a 20, the end of 2020, the one on the left, end of 2021. So they're a year apart. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but are they, they're all kind of in this new direction that you were mentioning with the interviews? Yeah. Um, when I painted Geneva on the right, the idea of this project was still kind of forming. So I interviewed mm -hmm. them super late. And then Yasmin, the one on the left, I painted more recently. Um, but yeah, I think I've said a lot about this project. <laughs> um, 
Amanda, do you want to mention anything about this one? I just thought, I don't know too much about this piece, but it feels like possibly very different from the other um, ghost people drawings. Yeah, it's, it's like a, and it's funny because I think those ghost drawings gave me like the courage to deal with some of the stuff in my mom's archives. Um, so these are, and this is actually, it's interesting you mentioned about scale because this photo is very small. It's, you know, it's, it's quite, it's, it could fit in a wallet, right? It's got a whole yeah. like, family or chosen family in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, um, it, it's, yeah, I'm just starting to experience. So it's, I photocopy these pictures on linen paper. I, I couldn't deal, I couldn't deal with actually no. <laughs> touching the thing <laughs> but it, it's interesting because I think we are I think people are now having to reckon with uh, their family's material legacy in ways that they really don't know how to deal with um because yeah. I've started to realize like it's not just me with my mom's archives like everyone has like tons of pictures and they like don't know what to do with them yeah <laughs> um so yeah I don't know I just put that out there as like this is this is what is being done to them you know, there it's layered history, sort of your mm -hmm. thoughts on the same plane, you know, as yeah. her experience. So is your mother in this photo? You know, I can't really tell. And she might be. And that sort of like just adds to the weirdness factor of it. <laughs> right. Right. Or she yeah. might be like taking the picture. Even. Right. Well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then Stephen, I mean, it, it's kind of like formally obvious, um, but I did want to put these on the same slide as an example of this, of like these moments where you're really zoom, zeroing in um, and trying to find uh, an identity that's specific. Uh, and then moments where like, the figure is still specific and identifiable and honored, but it's put kind of on the same plane as like all of these crazy fabrics that are representing moments of history and, and ways of communicating. So you have this same kind of like expansiveness versus the private precious, you know, yeah. arenas. Um, yes. Oh, go. No, no, nothing. I said, I said beautifully said. Oh, oh. <laughs> didn't want to cut you off. Um, and Jumana, the same thing. We're like <laughs> this super weird little hair clinging moment where it like has, it kind of reads figuratively, but maybe that's just me anthropomorphizing everything I see. It's kind of like got this motion where it's like a dramatic clinging. It's like trying to find something to hold on to. Um, and you have a lot of these moments, like what's happening on the right side where there's clearly an object somewhere deep in this realm, but we're only getting little bits that are like coming out of the surface. Um, so there's this weird sense of like a big space and, um, and an object that we don't know like how big it is in this space. It might be taking up a whole thing or it might be this little tiny thing, you know? Um, and then I just wanted to give a quick moment to, so we're a little over time. Are you guys okay? Or does anyone need to leave? Because we could wrap now. You guys good for like a few more slides? Okay. Um, because symbols seem pretty important. Um, so I just wanted to give a moment for that because it is a way of communicating to like the knowers of those symbols and what they mean. Um, so like you might have very overt ways of communicating or you might have ways that are more like whispers, function as whispers through symbols. Um, so Stephen, how do you handle, are you using symbols a lot? Yeah, I mean, everything in the frame of my images are intentional, from the color to mm -hmm. the flag, from the ripples, from the, everything is a symbol. Um, so, for example, the tiger um, in different cultures means different things. Uh, 
but in my culture, it can mean something else, you know, like strength or fluidity. Um, but there's these cultural cues that are not too intimidating, you know, that other mm -hmm. people from other cultures might be like, oh, wait, wait, this means this in mine. Or so, yeah, so playing with the duality of symbolism to lure you into my little story or a glimpse of my story is important. Another image that I thought was just like, you get the sense that it's chock full of narrative and everything, but it still also works formally on its own and, and communicates that way. Um, Jumana, I felt like this was a very symbol heavy image that maybe you want to talk about. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is an image again from Dreaming About Spinning a Snake in Half. This is one of the archival images that I was talking about where it's a very tight crop of the hands. Yeah. Again, in general, the hands being the symbol of indicators of pain or um, inflictors of pain or the ones shielding you from it. Um, but also the other symbol is the ring that my dad is wearing. Uh, so this is an image from my parents' wedding. Um, my mom is the one in the white glove and my dad is the one um, holding her hand. But uh, throughout the whole series, all of the crops have um, images of his hand and this ring. And just in general, in the Middle East or uh, the Middle Eastern men that I've known really do love to adorn themselves with um, gold rings and kind of gold jewelry. So that's always been kind of an indicator of um, wealth. And I mean it in like quote unquote wealth because it's just how it is. Um, and so I know for me seeing that image of his hand <clears throat> and seeing the image of the ring is like a very spot on um, memory, at least for me. So these little symbols, slight symbols of the personality and the history. Natalie, it seems to me like maybe you have, you are using certain objects as symbols or to place a narrative of some sort. Is that something you think about in compositions like this or your other work? Maybe more with the portraits? Yeah, um, I think a lot of my older works, specifically the still lives like these, used a lot of motifs um, that come from a memory or different memories. Um, and but they're sort of and they're specific to me, but they're generic enough to relate to others that really uh, sort of inviting of here's this uh, still life that has a lot of symbols of a pill bottle. What does that mean for me it can mean something different for you. Um, in my newer works, I need to think about that more, <laughs> the use of symbols. Like these ones. Um, also, so I, I wanna make, um, especially with this discussion topic, I do wanna ask you guys about um, quarantine and how that might have changed your work because um, it has a lot to do with these themes of like community, isolation, comfort, support. Um, Natalie, how, so during quarantine, you kind of, that was when you transitioned into these portrait paintings, right? Yeah. Or slightly um, after. Well, if I, I thought about it recently and I've actually been painting people of my community since high school, which is when I got oh, serious okay. about painting. It just comes and goes, you know, um, in different projects and different levels of how good they are. <laughs> or skill. Um, so it doesn't feel too new to me, even though for others it may seem, whoa, what is she doing? She's never done this before. I have. <laughs> um, forgot the question now, but. Oh, oh quarantine and like yeah. how it changed. So yeah, since quarantines has happened, um, I've sort of just been slowly expanding my community, you know, through Instagram, new jobs, trying out new things. And as my community has grown and I've developed these relationships, you know, what I want to paint and who I want to paint sort of just grows and goes into new directions. And the wanting to paint my coworker, Rohana, that is an idea that came to me one day where I was very uninspired, but then suddenly thought, oh, it'd be really fun to paint my coworker. Um, that wouldn't have happened had I not had that particular job or you know, things were different. 
um, Jumana, I used this image because I thought it was such a good metaphor for quarantine. <laughs> it's just like, you know, every this all this life happening outside and we're just kind of slowly. <laughs> um, so what happened to your work during quarantine? Oh, I think, um, hold on, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, this was actually taken during um, quarantine when I went back to um, North Carolina to stay with my mom. Um, I think this was like in March when everything was happening. Um, so during quarantine, I actually stepped away from my work a lot. Um, I wasn't really happy with the work that I was making. Uh, this was during the final semester of my junior year in college. Um, so it shifted kind of a lot where I wanted to go with my work next. Um, it was also kind of hard just in general not to be able to um, physically print um, images because it's yeah. like a very huge, um, I don't know, like it dictates a lot where I want to go with the work next, uh, seeing it in person and like really feeling it as well. Um, so it definitely shifted my perspective on um, kind of where I wanted to go further um, and, but at the same time, like, even though it, you know, the events that happened happened, it is nice that it led me to this body of work because this whole thing, pretty much this whole thing was done, um, during quarantine, um, and then pandemic on. So, yeah. Amanda, <laughs> I love this one. Cause it's like, there's a little bit of something sprouting. <laughs> yeah. right and that there's just it's a lot of transitions happening <laughs> yeah definitely it was a bit um I, you know putting wings on them really changes things yeah for me um and it I think quarantine heavier. yeah it's I think I have to just like let more of them come out you know to find yeah. out what um what it means because it's um, yeah, I think quarantine sort of, um, among many things, uh, led me to, to, to really look into my mother's papers. Um, cause so much, I think of being a, being a playwright or being in theater is like, you go to theater, you go away from your home. And so like, I didn't have to go to the theater. So I started, you know, like looking in the environment around me. Um, and, uh, and I was taking a class at the time that, uh, was focused on terrible Wait, angels. repeat that. It kind of cut out for me. Oh, Bob, sorry. You're taking a class. A class called Terrible Angels. Oh. Um, <laughs> which is a line from the from like one of Rilke's poems. Um, and so then dealing with this like concept of an angel in contrast to like an Anito or to a muse or to like Duende, you know, from like Lorca. Um I don't know. It's just like something I'm still still thinking about. But I think right now this is sort of like the only angel shadow shadow person people that exist, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to see where they might go. Okay. And lastly, Stephen, where um, how's your quarantine, and where are you walking gloriously out into the <laughs> sunshine toward? <laughs> uh, I mean. Such a I, badass photo. <laughs> I got I got so many stairs, but I felt good. Um, yeah, I mean, quarantine was interesting. I was doing my thesis during lockdown. I graduated like Jumana in 2020. And I, I started building a sculpture in my shower. I broke my shower head and I was like, fuck this, I'm done. So I took the time to like augment my bibliography. Um, we do cult, some cultural research, social research, interview my family, my friends, actually really for the first time sitting down with my grandparents and be like, all right, from A to Z, go tell me your life story. And that kind of saddened me a little bit that it took quarantine for me to really acknowledge the rich history of the people who have made me. So really a lot of reading, less creation. I needed to print. We didn't have space in it, so... Uh, but I wish I was there right now in that picture. But yeah. Okay, I'm gonna take us off. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat right now. I am going to allow people to unmute or to um, 
start, turn your cameras on if you do want to pose your question yourself. Otherwise, feel free to put it in the chat. We are over time. Um, so I'm just going to, while we're waiting for any questions that might come in, give the artists a minute to tell us what they have coming up, if anything, um, and maybe where you can see their work. So uh, maybe let's start with Amanda. Do you have anything coming down? If anyone happens to be in Laramie, Wyoming from April 20th to the 23rd, um, that play that we saw so many production stills of, Black Sky, that'll be going up with relative theatrics, uh, which, is, which is pretty exciting. So that's sort of the most immediate one. Um, and I guess I'll just also plug like, people can subscribe to my newsletter. That's kind of like where I announce these things um, and social media, et cetera, so. Yeah. Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Jumana, do you have anything um, lined I'm, up? Yeah, I'm working on a flower catalog. Uh, it's a very recent development. It's literally what it is. It's just like a small zine where it's um, images of flowers that I've taken throughout the years. Um, and I'm going to be printing it, I think, in the next month or two, um, once I figure out where I can, where I can print. Um, so that is something that I will be creating if anybody wants to take a look at it. And I'll be probably showing it on my Instagram or, and website. So. Sweet. Yes, all artists here have an Instagram. They're on, um, have websites that are on Ice Cream Social too. So it's easy to link through to them. Um, Natalie, what you got going on? Yeah, I have a work in this show called Cats and Dogs by APC No Rio and Chashama in their Chelsea gallery. Um, you can find it on my profile. I don't have the link with me right now. It's up <laughs> till the end of the month. Check it out, Cats and Dogs. And then I'm going to have a studio show early summer. Um, right. Like an open come. studio? Yeah, Is but like a same? one day only pop up show. Oh, cool. So okay. it'll be like this background, which is my <laughs> studio, but more paintings. Nice. And you're in Brooklyn. Yes. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, um, I have nothing going on right now. I just closed out a show last week, but in the summer, I have, if you happen to be in Mexico, Mexico City, I have a show there that opened in June, but follow me on my Insta. That's where I blast all my uh, stuff. I'm dry. That's so many doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Um, we do have one question. Does music affect your work? Post to everyone. Which is an interesting question. Music is very culturally anchored. I, yeah, I would say um, it's certainly a big part of my process, like making playlists that sort of like fit the story or the narrative that I'm trying to shape and just kind of listening to that over and over. And I do enjoy using music in my plays. I, I really love seeing it on stage, like people performing or singing, you know. Yeah. Anybody yeah, else? Yeah, music is pretty important. Um, it helps me weirdly visualize stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know, the colors come and I, I feel like I can visualize some, some parts of the photograph through music. But yeah, it's a good question. I never really thought about that too profoundly. Yeah, I find when I put on too much Amy Winehouse, I <laughs> get a little <laughs> like people gazy. I mean, I love her, but <laughs> it can get a little moody. Yeah. You got to balance it out. <laughs> Jumana, Natalie? Um, not, not as much, no. I think any other inspiration that I take that's not um, visual is probably just writing, like reading um, memoirs and <clears throat> personal essays, definitely anything like nonfiction. Um, anything John Didion <laughs> is a huge, huge inspiration, so. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've recently come to the conclusion that I need to listen to music to get into that flow state when you're painting where you just don't want to be interrupted. And that'll be almost anything. No, it's mostly indie or punk or just, you know, music that I'll like 
Um, yeah. And then I'll listen to podcasts before I paint, but I can't do podcasts while I'm painting. Just it gets you out of the flow state. That makes sense. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you everybody for staying on so far. <laughs> That's the time. Um, we do have, just a quick announcement, we do have one more virtual talk coming up on the 14th, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, and then a live uh, performance piece that Susan, uh, Susan Luss and Theo Trotter, who are also on the show, will be doing right here in Ice Cream Social in person. There's going to be movement involved, transforming one another's pieces. Um, so that's really exciting. And the show's only up until May 6th. So we're coming down to the last month of the show. If you haven't made it out yet, try your best to get here. Um, it's really something you guys see in person, especially in the daylight. The pieces do some cool stuff. Okay, well, I think we'll close out. Thank you again to the artists so much. Um, Ice Cream Social is held up by you guys. <laughs> um, and thank you to all our audience members who made it out tonight. All right. And thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank Good you, Jen, night. for curating, too. <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Good night.